the planet Ryushi had been chosen by the Yaucha leader, Dechande, for the hunt against the xenomorph creatures, the hard meat, as they called them, for the blooding of his young students. Since last visiting this planet for a hunt, Ryushi had seen the development by the Chigusa Corporation of the colony Prosperity Wells, overseen by one Machiko Noguchi. The colony's harvest was at its end, and Chigusa had assigned pilots Scott Conover and Tom Strandberg to pick up the payload via the company's transport vessel, the Lecter. Conover and Strandberg had flown together before. This was one of many assignments where the two had been paired. Oftentimes, in long flights to their destinations, conversations would range from the trivial to the intensely philosophical. Their mission en route to Ryushi was no exception. I don't understand what your problem is, Tom. It's not just my problem, Scott. It's everyone's problem. We can't just go along the way we are. What makes us think we can strip mine planets to their cores, or harvest whole species to extinction, or transform entire ecosystems to our whims? Be realistic, Tom. Everyone knew Earth's resources wouldn't last forever. What are we supposed to do? Ignore the other resources available to us, because a million years from now they might be of some use to an emerging life form? Do we just tell everyone, hey, show's over? Everything we need is on this planet over here, but we can't use any of it, because it rightfully belongs to the single-cell organisms that live there. You're taking this argument to a ridiculous extreme, Scott. No, I'm not. I'm just pointing out how irrational it is to compartmentalize your ethics, Tom. It's wrong to harvest dolphins because they're intelligent creatures, but it's okay to eat chickens because they only have a brain the size of a pea. Ultimately, every distinction is subjective, and any line you draw is artificial. Who's to say what potential lies within a chicken? Or even its egg? That's exactly my point, Scott. Except you're forgetting one thing, Tom. We're all living creatures, and all life is a struggle. No matter where you or anyone else may wish to draw the line, it still ends up as Darwin's survival of the fittest. Darwin never said survival of the fittest, Scott. That was an oversimplification that was used to sell his theory to the public. What you're talking about is manifest destiny. You can call it whatever you want, Tom. The fact remains that if the human race needs to do something to survive, and lower orders don't have the power to stop us, we'll prevail. It's not right or wrong. It's just the way things are. You've got to stop projecting human motives and emotions onto other organisms. Everything is merely what it is. A mongoose that tries to steal a cobra's egg isn't evil, it's just trying to survive. But the cobra is trying to survive too. And if it catches the mongoose in its nest, there's gonna be a fight. Fortunately for the mongoose, it has faster reflexes and a more efficient metabolism. Whether that's fair or not isn't even part of the equation. It's simply the way things are. Yeah? Try telling that to the cobra. But for the sake of argument, we'll ignore the question of ethics. Still, all you're saying, Scott, is that it's alright to do whatever we want, to exploit any ecosystem of any species, as long as we don't run into anything big enough to kick our butts. If you want to phrase it that way, yeah. That's the way nature works. Sure, on tutoring disks, but not in the real world. Every part of an ecosystem is dependent on every other part. It's that interdependency that makes interfering with existing systems so chancy. Even the smallest components are vitally important. Who would have guessed that millions of killer bees could spring from a handful of escaped African bees? Or that a few Brazilian fire ants could make the southeastern portion of the U.S. virtually uninhabitable in just over 70 years? And what about the oil-eating bacterium the gene splicers at the petroleum companies developed to clean up their spills? Remember how they thought they had it completely in their control? Come on, Tom. The oil would have dried up sooner or later anyway. And I hear the new repro inhibitors they're using are making a substantial dent in the fire ant populations. Sure, we suffer setbacks, but we'll always find ways around the problems that nature throws at us. Will we, Scott? I'm not so sure. Mankind never seems to learn. We get our hands slapped on a regular basis, but we still can't seem to keep them to ourselves. The tighter the grip we try to get on nature, the more nature pushes through the cracks in our technology. And with some of the things we're encountering in the settlements, we have no idea what kind of trouble we may be letting ourselves in for by messing around. Well, so far we've done okay. 
On all of the life-supporting planets we've come across, the worst thing we've ever encountered has been the Blood Willies on Epsilon Indy 2. And I hear they've got a vaccine for that now. If I were you, I'd put my faith in science and stop worrying about the boogeymen. I'd watch what I said around the corporate types, Tom. All any of them care about is their jobs, and you'll make them nervous with talk about problems that don't exist yet. I don't care. This is my last long haul. I'm getting out while the getting's good. All the monkeying around the corporations are doing out in the settlements may not bother you, Scott, but it does me. We've had a long run of good fortune. Longer than we've deserved. There's a major turd coming down the pike, mark my words. And I don't want to be around when it hits the fan. I'm telling you, we shouldn't be messing with Mother Nature. She's a real bitch. We have to learn to work with nature. This reliance on technology is getting to be too much for me, Scott. It's no longer a means to an end. It's become an end unto itself. We use it like a wall between ourselves and our surroundings. Between ourselves and who we really are. We've come a long way in the past 3,000 years. But I can't help feeling that we've lost as much as we've gained. So what's your solution, Tom? Give up modern conveniences and go back to stone knives and squatting in caves? You're reaching for extremes again, Scott, but that just might be what puts us back on the right track. And I'm not talking about austerity or deprivation. I'm talking about the challenge of putting away the crutches of our technology and going back to relying on our own strength and cunning. These days, we're so insulated that we make heroes out of anyone who dares to face up to a challenge. But it wasn't always like that. Life or death challenges used to be an everyday thing. And real men didn't wait for adventures to come to them. They rushed out to meet it. Not like the generals and corporate heads these days who send out the little guys to do their dirty work. It used to be that a man standing as a leader was determined by how he handled himself in the face of danger. Yeah, yeah, very nostalgic, Tom. Very macho. But it's not very practical in this day and age. Can you see a bunch of corporate VPs duking it out for the right to be CEO? Or maybe you and me going at each other with knives to see who gets a better pilot's rating. Hey, every culture observes its own rituals for establishing status. Look at the infighting and backstabbing that goes on at every level of our society. And we're still fighting for the same things. Prosperity, leadership, territorial rights. The only difference is our methods have become more subtle less direct. Somehow the old ways seemed more honest. You're an idealist, Tom. What happens when the wrong guy wins? Then you've got the neighborhood bully calling the shots. You're back to pack mentality. There are checks and balances in every system, Scott. Yeah, but your way leaves them all up to individual initiative. Without some kind of sanctioned avenue for dissent, a guy would have to be a real hero or a real fool to butt heads with a chief. So, are things really so different for us? You're the one that's always telling me to watch what I say around the desk jockeys. Where's my sanctioned avenue for dissent? At least if I bust a guy in the chops, he clearly understands that I don't like what he's doing. There you go with your idealism again. You're trying to romanticize this into two tigers brawling to determine dominance or rights to a favorite hunting area. In the same situation, humans would just kill each other. We've outgrown the instinct for species preservation that prevents in the lower orders, but we haven't truly grown into the morality that you're so fond of citing, Tom. The society we've built isn't perfect, granted, but it works. Probably more because of our level of technology than in spite of it. How many guys wouldn't want to trade their boring Earthside job for yours? A job made possible by technology. But if you want to get back to nature, there are ways to do it. Go on one of those wilderness safaris to Alpha C. I hear the gene splicers now have something that almost looks like an elephant. Or, if you want a real adventure, sign on for a hitch as a ranch hand at our next stop. Plenty of fresh air, hard work, and not much else. Maybe that's your idea of fulfillment, though I can't imagine anyone envying you the job. Me? I can get enough adventure from the vids. God bless modern technology. Scott and Tom's musings had happened to be put to a very explicit test after landing. Three species now struggled for dominance over the planet, with uncertain fates awaiting each. The pilots found themselves bound in a hive constructed by the xenomorph creatures. The Yaucha leader was in a coma, 
captured by the humans. And Machiko Noguchi was forced to take action in protecting the humans of Prosperity Wells, none at this point fully aware of the looming threat. I called a town meeting to fill everyone in on what was happening. It sounded unbelievable, even to me, but after we were unable to reach them by radio, I had a key to do a flyby of the Sheldon Ranch. The house was in flames, and the family's breeding stock had all been slaughtered. Noguchi and Hiroki walked into a room filled with low, nervous chatter and grim faces. The gathered ranchers and Chigusa staff fell silent and looked at them, their expressions fearful and expectant. The rec center was packed, but suddenly a hundred plus people didn't seem like so many. I'm not sure what you've heard, but I'll tell you what we know, Noguchi said. She consciously kept her voice low and firm. Panic in the crowd would help no one. Approximately two hours ago, Bobby Sheldon came into town on a flyer, alone. He said that his parents had been killed by a group of XT lifeforms. Just before he arrived, Spanner and Akita found an injured... being in Iowa Gorge that is currently unconscious in the med center. Bobby Sheldon identified this being as similar to the lifeforms that killed his parents. Noguchi took another deep breath. When we were unable to reach Mr. and Mrs. Sheldon by radio, we sent Ashley Akita on a flyby. I am sad to report that she just called in with the news that the Sheldon house is in flames and their breeding stock has been slaughtered. We must assume that an attack is imminent. There was a slight murmur through the crowd. A few people coughed. A few children started to cry softly. A young boy raised his hand. Yes? Is Bobby okay? The boy was no more than twelve. His voice was high and shaky, obviously upset by the situation. She nodded and attempted to smile. He has a sprained ankle and is in shock, but he'll be alright. Squires has agreed to watch him for a while. She scanned the room, watched the fearful crowd with a calm eye. This is bad, but we'll handle it. She felt in control. For once, the people of Ryushi looked to her to tell them what to do. She wouldn't let them down. If we could hold other questions for a few moments, I'll tell you what we propose. Mr. Shimura is in charge of security. All able-bodied personnel will be expected to take a shift on watch, and anyone not on duty will remain within the main complex. First, we'll have to do what we can to barricade the town with the cargo crates from the move here. She nodded at Mason. Mason here will head up that maneuver. Anyone trained on lift equipment will report to him after the meeting. There is a 33-hour curfew in effect as of now. No one will go anywhere alone unless they've cleared it with me or Hiroki, and it will have to be a good reason. Those of you with weapons, please list them with Spanner ASAP. Ben Davidson and Jess Johnson have volunteered to show our younger members holovid graphics at the school this afternoon, so meet with them afterward for specific times. People nodded. She could almost feel the fear in the room become less tangible. It was a good thing to remember that most crises just needed some organization and clear thinking to be handled efficiently. Hiroki read from a list the first watch team and then suggested another meeting later, at dusk or when the work was finished, whichever came first. As the gathering drew to its close, Noguchi was pleased to see that order and confidence had been restored quickly. Few of the ranchers had weapons of their own, and the corporate armory consisted of 15 scatterguns, primarily for use against firecrawlers and briarwolves, and 10 pistols earmarked for a police force the town had never needed. Prosperity Wells was never intended to be a fortress, but the ranchers, under Hiroki's direction, set up an admirable line of defense. The house-sized moving crates had been lined up around the perimeter of the compound quickly. With the willing aid of both the ranchers and the staff, the work had been neatly done. By twilight, the work was finished. We didn't know yet that the work was in vain. Noguchi sat in the op center, hunched over a cup of black coffee that was barely tepid. Her body ached from all the work. Hiroki had insisted that she take five, and she was only too glad to comply. Hiroki was going to take a team to walk the compound and secure any place they had missed. Around her, four staffers watched screens. Noguchi was exhausted, and there was still too much to do. Too many variables to consider. Like the lector. Noguchi straightened. The crew outside was just finishing up, and another meeting was coming up within the hour. But had she seen anyone from the ship? That obnoxious conover. Weaver, have you seen Collins anywhere? The tall, dark-haired staff woman looked up from her console. 
Uh, we can't find Collins. No one has seen him since this afternoon when you sent him out to the lector. Noguchi shook her head. Do I have to do everything around here myself? All right. I'm going out there. She almost collided with Hiroki in the doorway. Hold it. Going out where? Hiroki looked like she felt. Dark smears of dust painted his face, and his eyes looked weary and old. To the lector, Colin still hasn't come back from the ship. I'm going to find out what's going on with them, but first I'm going to see if I can talk some sense into Dr. Revna. Hiroki frowned. It's not safe, Michiko. His tone was gentle. She felt oddly touched by his concern, but she was also tired of not knowing what the hell the ship was up to. Someone has to go. May as well be me. Hiroki looked at her seriously for a beat and then unhooked his holster strap. He handed the revolver to her, but first. I see you've made up your mind, but take this. It's 12.5mm Smith. It belonged to my grandfather. It is loaded with jacketed bullets for hunting big game. She stared at the weapon. He pushed it into her hands. If you have to shoot something, make sure it has a thick wall behind it. These bullets will go right through a rinth. I'll call the sentries and let them know you're on your way. Right. Have Weaver set up the sat link as soon as the sun sets, and ask them to cut a deal for marine support. She smiled tiredly. And thanks, Hiroki. Be careful. He smiled in return. You're doing a good job, Machiko. She walked into the late afternoon heat and headed for the med center, her thoughts jumbled with exhaustion. There was still a crew of a dozen or so outside, setting the final walls into place. A day earlier, the spectacle of Ryushi's double sunset had struck me as beautiful. Now the suns winked mockingly from the horizon, gloating that the passage of a single day could transform Prosperity Wells from a place of celebration to an armed camp. Miriam watched the stats on the screen with something like awe. She was glad to have something to do besides worry over Kassar. And the alien was distracting, to say the least, now that Bobby was gone. Her stomach tightened at the thought of her husband. She had always thought that she would know if he was gone. That deep knowing that two people shared if enough years had passed. But there was nothing. She just missed him. She kept thinking of what she would say about the incredible reads that flashed across the console. Doctor? Revna turned in her chair, heart pounding. Miss Noguchi? The attractive Japanese woman smiled gently. I'm sorry, we haven't heard anything. The doctor took a deep breath. Then you've come to check on our patient. The gentle smile never left Noguchi's face. The obvious sympathy there made Revna want to cry, so she turned back to the screen. I'll let you know if he regains consciousness, she said. Doctor, I'd like to move you and your visitor to the main complex. The security is better there. Thank you, no, said Revna. I prefer to remain here. I have everything I need to look after my patient. She hoped she sounded collected and normal, but she heard her voice crack slightly at the truth. Besides, this is where Kessar will come when he returns. She didn't turn around, but she sensed the Noguchi woman's hesitation. Very well, doctor, she said. I'll check back on you later. Thank you, Miss Noguchi. Michiko. Dr. Revna was fooling herself. No one doubted that the Doc had met the same fate as the Sheldons. Maybe we were all fooling ourselves. We had no way of guessing the enemy's strength or intentions, no clue as to its tactics or strategies. In a sense, the invaders, if that's what they were, had already won. The mere fact of their existence had disturbed our lives and put us on the defensive. It wasn't likely to accomplish much, but the trip out to the lector was at least a positive action. It made me feel as if we hadn't lost all of the initiative. Mason rolled his head and yawned. He and Riley had run out of things to say about 20 minutes ago. The initial adrenaline of the situation was long gone, and their nervous small talk had disintegrated into a watchful silence. At least it wouldn't get any hotter today. The suns were headed down. And in another hour or so, he and Riley would be inside drinking beer and shooting the shit. He pitied the next watch, being out there after dark would be a bitch. Hi Riley, hi Mason. The boss lady walked toward them smoothly, a smile of greeting on her lips. Speak of the devil. Riley nodded back and Mason stepped forward. Miss Noguchi, he said politely. Mr. Shimura said you were coming. I'm to escort you to the lector. Let me guess, Mason. 
Hiroki ordered you to follow me even if I declined your escort. Yes, ma'am. She nodded and sighed. Well, come on then. He jogged to catch up to Noguchi and walked in front of her. This would be a prime opportunity to tell the management what he had been thinking. You know, I think we're worrying too much. I mean, look at the size of the complex. He looked back at Noguchi and stopped at the base of the ramp for her to catch up. She didn't answer, didn't even look at him really. I think those XTs are going to take one look at Prosperity Wells and go back home, he continued. Fuck her anyway. He stepped into the open door to the top of the ramp and pointed his scattergun at nothing in particular. It was dark in there. He took another step inside and then turned his head to call back to the Ice Queen. Just give me a second to get the lights. He edged to the left and groped blindly with one hand. Something wet dripped on his hand. He got the impression of sudden movement overhead. And then there was only pain. Noguchi stood at the top of the ramp and turned to look at him just in time to see him lifted straight up into the darkness. There was a strangled, wet cry, and the darkness rushed forward to greet her. A dozen arms and a thousand teeth, all screaming, all hungry. The dream I'd been unable to remember earlier came back to me with sudden, horrifying clarity. Only it wasn't a dream. It was a nightmare. And it was real. Noguchi grabbed for the revolver in slow motion. The single patch of darkness separated into many forms. She fell backward as the dozen or so nightmares came at her. She fired four times and stumbled down the ramp without looking. The deafening shots echoed from the walls and in her head, and two of the things dropped. She backed up against the shield wall, revolver extended toward the huge bugs. They came, but slower, and their short, twisted limbs reached for her. They hissed and cried out like demented banshees. Double rows of teeth snapped and dripped clear, slimy mucus. Noguchi didn't take her gaze off them, even as she heard more of the things come down the ramp. She was going to die. She panted shallowly and backed farther up the incline, revolver heavy in her trembling hands. Another of the bugs rushed forward with a scream. She jerked the trigger again and again. The thing howled in fury and pain and fell. She fired again. Only, the shots were quiet, dull clicks. The gun was empty. The nightmares advanced. She backed up, her last moment of life. Nothing flashed before her eyes save the horror coming for her. No memories, fond or otherwise, came to haunt or comfort her. She was in the moment, and in this moment, the leading bug cried out and jumped. And a hollow thump sounded behind her, as if something had imploded. A rush of heat stirred her hair, and the creature closest flew backward in a rain of hissing liquid its head gone. The horde screamed in unison but stayed at the bottom of the wall, their dark limbs clattering on the ground. In... anger. Noguchi risked a glance behind her. It was the monster, masked and armored. It held the spear with the broken shaft, except it was whole now, the long pole mended. The heavy dark weapon it held was slightly different. It wasn't the creature from the med lab. It was one of the others, the killers. It aimed the weapon at her and fired. Noguchi felt a cry escape her throat, and another of the bugs exploded behind her. She looked back down at the advancing army and felt a rush of air again behind her. The monster warrior leapt over her and landed on the pack of seething black bugs. Noguchi could do nothing but stare. We'd done our best, with limited personnel and resources to fortify Prosperity Wells against the invaders. We could have saved ourselves the trouble. We weren't the targets of the invasion. We were merely bystanders caught between two opposing forces. Hulking humanoid warriors like our patient in the med center and the silent eyeless monsters that haunted my dreams. Perhaps it was this connection to my nightmares, as well as the fact that the monsters had killed Mason, that predisposed me against them. On the other hand, the warrior had saved my life, and it was more human than it's his adversaries. Maybe it was just his resemblance to my mental pictures of the samurai and warrior monks who peopled the stories from my childhood. Or it could have been that it's simply human nature to cheer for the underdog. Whatever the reason, I caught my breath as the warrior leapt, heroically, it seemed, into battle. His movements were so swift I could scarcely follow them. The savage spear sliced and cut another bug into pieces. Another shot from the strange weapon and dismembered limbs clattered to the ground. So powerful. 
so assured, so deadly, yet ultimately futile. More of the bugs came down the ramp, scrabbled wildly to get at the warrior. Noguchi, still unable to move, looked on at the storm of death and battle. Gikyan had been sent in to scout, but the hunting he had found was too good to walk away from. Here was a sickly pale Uman, with no defense. He had watched as the covering Uman's small burner died, then as the Kande Admida swarm approached the Uman. It did not seem able to defend itself. Where was its spear, its wrist knives? This terrified creature was the monster of which he had been frightened as a suckling? It was a joke. The Uman was thigh day without him. He would save the ugly creature for later. First, the hard meat. He fired again, and was again rewarded with a shower of acidic thway. The hard meat screamed in loss. Gukyong howled the war cry and jumped. He landed amid the hissing drones and moved among them, deadly and quick. So easy. He spun and slashed, burned and cut at the same time. Two bugs fell with one slice of his spear. A drone from behind lost its head. He gutted yet another. More came at him, a relentless flow of fury and sound. He pivoted, hunted, his every movement was an arc of doom and pain. Noguchi gulped air and pushed herself backward, toward the top of the shield wall. The warrior was a dervish of wild energy and prowess. The nightmare creatures fell around him, but more monsters flooded toward him. And despite the fighter's speed and strength, he fought poorly. The clamoring dark animals surrounded him, pulled him down. The warrior struggled, but to no avail. One of the giant bugs ripped off his mask with one spidery clawed arm and plunged its razor teeth forward. Noguchi scrambled backward into her feet to top the wall. She ran back toward the complex and didn't look back. The cries of hunger and triumph followed her, told her the warrior was no more. There's a big difference between heroism and stupidity. In the end, the warrior gained nothing but a glorious and pointless death. I didn't look back. I had learned a long time ago. Never align yourself with a loser. The noise came from a million clicks to his right. It was a familiar sound, one he had known for a very long time back on Earth, from before he knew what it meant. Scott opened his swollen eyes to blackness and took a deep breath. He almost choked on the cloying wet air. Scott, are you awake? Can you hear me? He coughed, the minor movement sparking a thousand pains. Yeah. He swallowed gummy spittle and turned his head toward the voice. Tom? I think I can get my arm free, the other pilot said. Scott couldn't see him, but his friend was only a few meters away from the sounds of hurried struggle. The rest of the nightmare clicked into place. Where did they go? Scott strained to see in the dark room, memories of hissing motion and giant teeth adding sharp panic to his dull and clouded mind. Tom, did you see them? Where did they all go? Shh, I'm almost out. A grunt of exertion in Tom's welcome face appeared in front of him, grimy, fearful, pale. Hurry! Jesus, where did they go? Get me out of this. Hurry, please. Be quiet. Tom spoke in a harsh whisper and reached for Scott's immobilized hands. The ropes of resinous dark material holding him in place snapped and crumbled to the floor. Tom glanced over his shoulder every second, eyes wide. As soon as one of his arms was free, Scott tore at the weird matter at his midriff and leg and tumbled to the floor. He had been suspended half a meter in the air. Tom slipped an arm around his waist and helped him up, speaking quickly and quietly. They were all around us, and something happened outside. I guess they swarmed out of here, like mad bees. And I didn't know if you were here. Tom seemed to realize he was babbling and cut himself off. It's okay, man. Just let's get the hell out of here, okay? Leaning on each other heavily, they stumbled toward the emergency hatch. It was hard to see anything, but Scott could make out areas of the dock where the shadows were denser, more solid. A raspy breath came from one of the darker corners of the room. Scott stopped and turned toward the noise. At first he couldn't see what was the cause, and then he was unable to believe what he saw. It was one of the creatures. It was bigger than the others. Its huge, flattened skull was curved downward, its limbs drawn up in front of its dripping jaws. The thing was curled up. A horrible caricature of the human fetal position. I think it's asleep, 
Tom said softly. It hasn't moved since before all the other ones left. Scott couldn't pull his gaze away from the dormant monster, the slow rise and fall of the thing's furled body with each slow breath. It was the most frightening thing he had ever seen, like a giant spider lizard with knives for teeth, deadly, insectile. Strings of sticky goo fell from its jaws. The dim light of the partly open dock door reflected the glistening slime. Let's go before she wakes up, Tom whispered urgently. She? Scott shook his head and looked at the pilot, but Tom was already pulling him toward the hatch. Yeah, Scott whispered back. He wanted nothing more than to get the fuck out of there. Get help, get weapons, just see another human face. But as they hurried to their escape, Scott glanced over his shoulder to look at the thing once again. Where had they come from? What were they capable of? There was something strangely familiar about them. He did a double take. His heart pounded. The angle of the creature's head seemed to have changed slightly. Come on! Tom pulled at his arm. Scott nodded mutely and followed. There would be time to think about why later. But not now. Not fucking now. Noguchi ran through the deserted streets of Prosperity Wells. There was a distant thunder, harsh and unreal. Thunder? She grabbed for the comm set around her neck, feeling like an idiot for not having thought of it before. Everything had happened so fast. Hiroki, this is Machiko, do you read? A hiss of static, and then thunder assaulted her ears. She twisted the volume switch in a panic. Not thunder. Gunfire. Hiroki! Come in, please. Machiko? The reception was bad, but it was him. The sound of his voice was music. I read you, Machiko. Where are you? I'm approaching the South Lock. Listen, we're in real trouble. You're not going to believe what we're up against. At this point, I'd believe anything, Hiroki said. His usual calm was gone, replaced by tension and worry. The sounds of weapon fire clattered loudly through the coin, blocking out whatever he said next. Hiroki, where are you? Her thoughts buzzed and clamored loudly as she stopped in the street and listened. Nothing. Hiroki, are you there? Her voice cracked in tension. Noguchi slapped the receiver hard. I can't hear you. His next words came through clearly. Machiko, I never thought we'd be friends, but... Uh, take care of yourself, alright? Hiroki, what are you- We're welding the inner doors of the west lock shut. We'll hold them off as long as possible. Though, I wish we could see what we're shooting at. We'll give you a chance to get everyone to the lector. Hiroki, no! She breathed, and the calm fuzzed out. He was gone. There had to be another way. The lector wasn't an option anymore. There was nowhere to go. Noguchi ran toward the main well where Riley and Mason had been only a few moments before. Riley lay face down in the dust, the late sun shining on the pool of red that had formed around him. His rifle lay nearby. She ran to the fallen form and crouched next to it. She pressed thumb fingers to Riley's throat and gagged on the thick, metallic scent of fresh blood. No pulse. Shit, she whispered. She looked around, eyes wide. She reached for Riley's rifle quickly, stood. She heard a sound right behind her. Nothing so much like a sharp intake of breath. It wasn't Riley, that was certain. She turned and saw nothing. She let out a sigh of relief. There was a lot to be worried about, but no immediate threat at least. That was when the earth rose up, the dust wavering in the dimming light, to knock her to the ground. She swung the heavy rifle up. Too slow. Time expanded, flowed like thick oil. It took a millennium to thrust the weapon against her shoulder and aim. Darkness sprang and covered the dragon. Invisibility. That's how the warriors had gotten past our defenses. But invisibility has little meaning to creatures with no eyes. From the main well structure behind the creature, the metallic black bugs shrieked and swarmed and fell on him, their talons fast and sharp. Noguchi had not seen them there, hadn't heard them come. It didn't matter. She jumped to her feet and stumbled backward, watched as the warrior hit the ground and screamed horribly. The nightmare insects cried and tore at their prey. A pale green fluid, the dragon's blood, sprayed the dark animals. They threw back their obscenely long heads and screamed. Fuck this. 
Noguchi turned and ran. Her heart thudded dully in her chest as she ran the dozen meters or so. Reuben Hine, one of the geotechs, was on watch at the ops panel near the south lock. His face was pressed closely to the loophole in the wall. He held up a hand for silence as the seconds ticked by. Get ready. Something's coming. Roth took a position toward the front of the group and trained her weapon on the reinforced plexi door, arm steady. The tension around her was heavy. They didn't know enough about the aliens, what they were after, or what they could do. Maybe they wouldn't be so easy to kill. It's okay. Don't shoot, Hein called. It's Noguchi. Roth hadn't realized how nervous she had been until his words flooded her with cool relief. She and the others lowered their weapons and stepped back from the door. Noguchi had obviously been in a fight. Her clothes were rumpled and dusty. Her normally sleek hair was plastered to her head in strings, her face flushed. She walked in quickly and surveyed the situation. Did you see them? What the hell are they? How many are there? Too many, said Noguchi. She turned to the assembled group of ranchers and company people and spoke clearly, her voice one of authority. Fall back to the inner doors and get someone with a welding torch over here. Seal all the doors. Upper level two, except the east lock. And no one goes in or out without my authorization. She looked at Hein. Are we organized enough to get this done without tripping over each other? He nodded. I'll make sure of it. Are there children here? Lauren Gaunt spoke up. Yeah, they're eating in the back conference room with Davidson and Johnson. Noguchi exhaled slightly, and some of the tension left her shoulders. She picked out Spanner in the crowd and walked over to him, her revolver extended butt first. Please load this for me, and get me some extra rounds for it. More of the armor piercing rounds like it had before. He took the weapon carefully. How much extra ammo you think you'll need? Will three extra clips be enough? Make it five. No. Ten. And seal those doors. She walked back toward the ops panel, not noticing the effect her words had on the group. A low murmur rippled through the room. The Japanese woman stopped near the board and spoke calmly to one of the staffers. Downey, do you have that sat link hooked up yet? Little Signy's still interfering, but it'll be below the horizon in the next hour. Noguchi nodded at that and turned to Weaver. What you have on the camera? Can you get me a fix on Hiroki and his team? Weaver looked up at Noguchi slowly and said nothing. Her brimming eyes said enough. Noguchi threw her comset on the panel and took the one that Weaver held out. She stood behind Weaver's chair and looked at the scant visual. Hiroki, this is Machiko, do you read? Her voice held an edge of panic. Machiko? The reception was terrible, but Machiko felt her spirits lift slightly. He wasn't dead. You in the tower? Johnson, get down. More static. Noguchi grasped the comm tightly, as if doing so would help somehow. She spoke in a rush. Listen, Hiroki, tell your team to stand by. We're going to open the doors and pull you in. Do you read me? Tell your team to stand by. Hiroki had backed up so that part of his profile was visible in the screen. He held a rifle aimed off screen and pulled the trigger uselessly. No time, he spoke in a half shout. On screen, Hiroki held the rifle up by its barrel, like a club. Static. No team left. Just Johnson and me. I don't think we hit any of them. Ammo's gone. Us too, I guess. He said something else, but his words were drowned out by the sound of breaking plexiglass. Hiroki held his empty rifle higher. Someone, Johnson, shouted off screen. Here they come. Stay safe, Machi- Static. She watched as huge, dark shapes, the alien warriors, swarmed onto the screen. Hiroki brought the rifle down, hard, to no effect. The attacker he had tried to fend off knocked him to the floor easily, as if he were a child. Mercifully, he fell out of the camera's range. But the pool of red that flowed sluggishly into view must have come from Hiroki. Noguchi made a strangled sound deep in her throat and looked away. The mighty Yaucha burst through the shoddy Uman defenses with no further losses. There were only two of the soft meats still upright, and they fell in the span of a breath. Tichinde himself took out the smaller of the two. The Uman tried to stop him with a dead burner, like a staff. There was no contest. Noguchi sat on her bed and stared at the floor, one shaky hand on her forehead. She didn't feel much of anything. 
At first there had been a huge sadness, but it had been replaced with a kind of dull acceptance. Hiroki was dead. He and the others had sacrificed themselves for the rest of the colony, and she had failed to use the time he had bought for them. She had failed at everything. Part of her mind kept shouting at her, Organize. Get this under control. Get yourself together. It was the same voice that had pushed her through most of her life, the driver of the strong Machiko who allowed her to hold her head up. It clamored in her thoughts now, directed her to get up, get up now, and get going, but she let it run itself in circles. Where was she to go? Noguchi felt as if she had been sitting there for hours, but she knew it had only been a few minutes. Funny. All she really wanted to do was lie down and sleep until she woke up at home, on Earth, back in the tiny apartment she'd left a million years ago. Would that be so bad? Just to give up and wait there until help came? Until the damn company sent someone to pick them up? They could probably hold out, just do some heavy reinforcing of the locks and then sit tight. Maybe she could even stay here, in her room. The people downstairs could make do without her. They would figure out something. Hide away, do nothing, wait. Yes, that felt right. Miss Noguchi? A soft voice crackled over her calm. Noguchi felt her stomach tighten at the sound. Why did they need her? It wasn't fair. She couldn't run a battle. She was an overseer, for Christ's sake. Miss Noguchi, this is Weaver. The hesitant voice called again. Noguchi sighed. Yes, what is it? It didn't matter. None of it did. I'm sorry to interrupt you or anything. I thought... I mean... I know you and Mr. Shimura were friends. And I'm sorry to bother... What? She wanted to feel angry, but there was nothing. There's something you should see. I could transfer it to your screen. It's the feed from the security cam on the southwest side of the tower. It's dark, though I've boosted the gain. I guess there are a lot of lights out over there. Noguchi turned wearily and looked at the console on her wall, already sorry she'd admitted to being there. Fuck these people. They didn't even like her. What did they expect? Why did she have to take care of them? Why her? The screen snapped on. It was a bonfire. At first, Noguchi didn't recognize that it was a picture from anywhere on Ryushi. She was reminded of old hollows she had seen on Earth, of tribal dancing, ritual stuff. But the dancers were the warriors. The dragons. Well, no, not really dragons. Aliens. There were five or six of them, the creatures who had killed Hiroki and the others. They ran and stumbled and jumped high in the air all around the fire, which was probably built with debris from the West Lock. Sparks flew, flame cracked and rose into the early evening sky as the aliens danced and circled, and they carried spears. There was no audio, but Noguchi could imagine the howls of victory, for the spears they held high in the air were decorated with their conquests. As she watched, one of the warriors danced past the cam with one of the Black Nightmare bug skulls jammed onto the point of his spear. And the next warrior... She quickly looked away, then returned her gaze to the screen. She didn't want to believe what she had seen, but it was true. Fuzzy and distorted by the heat and bad lighting, but there. Hiroki's decapitated head on the tip of the creature's spear, the sharp bladed end running through his neck and out of his mouth. For just a moment, she thought she might vomit. The alien danced from view, but Noguchi had seen what she needed to see. The nausea had passed. Something new, some new feeling, was filling her up. It wasn't sorrow or sickness, although she felt both of those things. No, it was dark and solid and throbbing like a huge black machine that had started running deep inside, at the core of her being. It was a physical sensation, this feeling. A rumble of newness. It was many things, but the easiest to understand was the anger. She watched the celebrating warriors and felt the apathy get eaten by the new machine, chewed and burned away, fuel for the thing at the center. It cleared her mind, for she knew what she would need to do. She was going to kill them. All of them. Not just for Hiroki's death or the lives of the ranchers, or her career. She felt almost selfish about her reasons, but in the end it wouldn't matter. They would die because they dared to try her. She was a woman of honor, and they stood against her. 
Roth and Ackland stood near the table where Hein sat, Noguchi's gun in front of him. A lot of the others watched also, although there really wasn't much to see. He fed rounds in slowly and the metallic clicks were loud in the quiet room when he closed the latch knob. It had been pretty silent here since Hiroki's last transmission. Noguchi had been gone for about 20 minutes or so, which was just as well. Ten clips, Hein announced, to no one in particular. She's not thinking of going out there, is she? You guessed it. Noguchi stepped into the room quietly. Miss Noguchi! Ackland looked and sounded confused. She had pulled her hair back and knotted it tightly at the base of her neck. She wore a fully padded coverall, the kind that the Rinth workers wore during gelding time. The suit was designed to dull impact from stray kicks, and had saved Roth herself from a lot of injuries. She had strapped a carbine to her back and wore knee and elbow leathers, as well as gloves. Comset hung loosely around her neck, and her eyes were cold and hard. Noguchi was back, and looked like a woman to reckon with. Who owns the fastest hover bike? She said, her voice cool. Roth said, I... I guess I do. Noguchi nodded at her. Where's it parked? East lock. Keycard's in it. Noguchi smiled briefly at her, the expression calm and yet somehow chilling. The Nitrogen Queen was back, only this time there was something else under the icy facade. Ackland turned to face Noguchi. That's it? You're taking off? What about the rest of us? His voice was heavy with anger, his composure blustery. I thought you were supposed to be in charge. Where's your sense of responsibility? Noguchi took a deep breath, and then she punched Ackland in the jaw, hard. The anger rested in her like a dormant but wild animal, waiting to be awakened and used. Noguchi knew she had bigger things to deal with than this overblown rancher who stood fuming, his fat finger pointed at her chest, but she had had more than enough from him. She took a deep breath and jabbed. It was a reaction more than a decision. Acklin folded, gasped, and fell to the floor. She heard the people all around step back. Two or three applauded. Responsibility? Her voice sounded strange to her ears, cold and furious. Hiroki is dead. And this whole mess is your fault, Ackland. If we live through this, you're going to find out what happens to people who are responsible. Ackland was still on the floor, face red, trying to catch his breath. The anger suddenly coiled back to a resting state, left her exhilarated and exhausted all at once. Ackland was an annoyance, but nothing to slow down for. Like a headache. She raised her gaze and looked around at the watching crowd. The faces she saw weren't angry, just somber. Maybe Ackland wasn't quite as popular as he thought. The only important thing now was getting the job done, the job she was responsible for. Hunting down the things that disturbed Prosperity Wells, but not simply for vengeance. For honor. Noguchi raised her voice so that everyone could hear. Weaver's in charge until I get back. You'll follow her orders, to the letter. Do I make myself clear? A few of the ranchers nodded. It would have to do. Several of the ranchers and employees followed her down the long hall to the East Lock, but she didn't have anything else to tell them. She had an idea, but the details weren't quite worked out yet. She had told Weaver the basics over the comm, so help on this end was covered. But judging from how fast Hiroki and his team had been taken out, time couldn't be wasted on planning. She'd have to play it mostly by ear. She reached the East Lock and peered out of the loophole window. The bike was only a few meters from the entry. The deepening dusk was deceptively peaceful looking. Quiet. Hein stepped up behind her, expression set. The coast is clear. For now, he said softly. Okay. If you haven't gotten my signal in 20 minutes, this door gets welded shut, and no one comes in or goes out until the Marines get here. If they get here. What about you? If you don't get my signal in 20 minutes, it'll be because I'm dead. Noguchi jumped on the bike and stabbed at the key at the same time. Her adrenaline was an overload, her breath shallow. Everything around her had slowed down, but she was at light speed. She jammed the accelerator down and flew toward the lector, free from fear. Death wasn't so scary once decided on. Noguchi didn't want to die, but the odds weren't in her favor. After seeing Hiroki's head on a spear, she had accepted the futility of the situation. She would probably die, but not without company. It was surprising how easy it was to think about death. No hesitation. No fear. I knew what I was doing. I was out for blood. The strange thing 
was how calm I felt. I'd always believed revenge to be a hot-blooded action, an in-the-heat-of-the-passion feeling, something that would overwhelm a person and cloud her judgment. But I was in complete control. I knew exactly what I was doing. There was an overpass ahead, the second-story walkway between the sewage treatment plant and the main well. Noguchi followed the pedal. The shadows there were thick and secretive. She was halfway through when the dark exploded to life. The attack came from her left. A high shriek, then something big and heavy hit. The bike tipped, veered toward a wall in the dark, claws ripped, the bike righted. She hit it, heard the cry of pain and rage. It clutched at the cycle, scrabbled up, loomed above her. There was a meter-thick beam under the walkway, barely visible in the dark. Noguchi ducked low and flew straight at it. The bug's howl was cut short, and the bike lifted again. Noguchi circled back and headed for the ship, heart pounding. In spite of the physical reaction, she felt calm. Very awake, but not panicked. She slammed on the brake suddenly and cried out, enraged by her own stupidity. Shit, shit, shit. Miriam Revna. She had forgotten. After the initial conquest, Tachinde left the Yaucha to circle the Uman dwellings and get a feel for where the others might be. There were many in the same structure as the first group, but he wanted to be certain that there weren't more, perhaps waiting to ambush them. He walked and heard the sound of machinery behind him, coming closer. Tachinde blended with the shadows as they all had been taught and waited to see what would come. He patted the mesh sack on his belt. There were already three Uman trophies in it. There would be more. A single Uman drove a small aircraft into view, landed it, then ran into one of the dwellings, a short burner in its hand. Tachinde pressed the loop control on his shift suit, one that he had salvaged from the wreck, to record the language spoken. The tiny Uman shouted and then entered the building at the beck of another Uman inside. The comms had been cut out for several hours before Miriam heard the shots echo through the compound. There had been gunfire before, but it hadn't been so close. Several times she had heard weird screams, alien sounds. A hover bike pulled up outside and Miriam heard running footsteps. Perhaps it was Kesar. She knew it wasn't somewhere inside even before she heard Machiko Noguchi's voice. Dr. Revna, it's me, Machiko. Miriam went to the door. She punched the entry button and looked outside, cautiously. It was the Overseer. She wore a padded coverall and held a rifle. Her gaze scanned from left to right as she edged into the lab, facing out. As soon as she was inside, Miriam hit the control and the door slid shut. Machiko, I heard shooting. Is everything alright? The younger woman turned to face her. Miriam was struck by the changes she saw in Noguchi's cool expression. Something huge had occurred, something that made everything different. It was her eyes, in the set of her mouth. No, things are bad, and they're about to get worse. In spite of the circumstances, Machiko Noguchi sounded calm. Can you handle a hover bike? Miriam shook her head. No, I never learned. I always relied on Kesar. Machiko cut her off, held up the rifle she carried. No good. I don't have time to get you back to the tower. Okay, let's see. Do you know how to use one of these? Miriam shook her head again. Michiko handed it to her anyway and spoke quickly. It's a semi-automatic, so it does all the work for you. Just aim it at the belly of whomever you want to shoot and squeeze this trigger. She motioned at the crook of the rifle. You only have six rounds, so don't waste any on warning shots. Miriam took the rifle hesitantly and frowned. Miss Naguchi, I'm a doctor, not a soldier. This isn't war, Noguchi said softly. This is survival. Miriam felt tears in her eyes, but she wasn't sure why. Who, who might I be shooting at? The words were strange in her mouth. Don't worry, you'll know when the time comes, Michiko said. She walked over to the patient and the table of artifacts and picked up the odd shield she and Hiroki had studied before. She held it up toward Miriam. Tell me, Miriam. The unclassifieds Roth brought you. Kessar's report said he thought they might transport eggs or spores to host bodies. Is it possible that when those spores grew up, they'd look like this? It's impossible to say, Miriam said slowly. She felt horribly confused. Why do you ask? Because I've seen some of these things tonight. There were dozens, maybe hundreds of them, in the lector. 
and I think Acklin's rinth were infected. She paused, or impregnated, by these things. And they've spread it to all of the herds on the ship, and I think our two unclassifieds are somehow connected. Miriam looked over to the specimen strapped to the table. Not biologically. They're quite different in chemical makeup. Machiko nodded. There's no time to worry about it now anyway. She looked at the injured alien. We ought to shoot that thing, she said. But maybe we'll need it as a hostage later. She walked toward the door. What are you going to do? Noguchi turned. I have an idea or two. You know Rinth temperament, right? I've got 3,000 head that have been crammed into holding pens since last night. What kind of mood do you think they're in right now? Listen, I want you to stay here, okay? Outside is not safe. Keep the door locked. I'll come back for you as soon as I can, but if you haven't seen me within the next hour, start thinking about how you can get to Ops. Wait until daylight and take the rifle when you go. I'll tell the ranchers to watch for you. And she was gone, just like that. Miriam set the heavy weapon on the table and stood with her eyes closed for a moment. It was all like a dream, surreal and frightening. None of this could be happening. She looked at the alien creature on the exam table and tried to get her thoughts in order. I know, my Kessar is dead. And perhaps you had something to do with it. Maybe you had your reasons. But it just seems so wasteful. We could learn so much from one another. There was a sudden scratching sound at the door. A sliding knock. Dr. Revna, it's me, Machiko. It's me, Machiko. Why had she come back? Miriam hurried to the door. Miss Noguchi, I... Words escaped. The patient. No, it was a creature like the one on the table. Miriam turned and ran, even as the armored monster clutched for her. The weapon. Table. Trigger. She ran, but the thing screamed behind her, too close. She was going to die. Tichinde ran forward and screamed for blood. The Uman stumbled back, turned, and ran for a table, a table with a strange burner on it. Tichinde raised his bladed staff high, ready for the final cut. And there was something familiar here. A scent he knew. But it didn't matter because the Uman must die. The Uman raised the burner slowly and fired, the shot far and wide, then another. And Tichinde brought the blade down, prowess and certainty in the final cut. Noguchi heard a shot, and then another. It came from the lab, or somewhere near it. She had stopped at the main control hatch for the front six buildings of the compound and studied the numbers, not certain of the proper codes for what she needed to do. She'd punched buttons, pretty sure that she had gotten it right, and checked her chronograph. The shots made her jump. They were accompanied by a shrill and primal scream. Noguchi jumped on the bike, turned back toward the lab, and hoped she would get there in time. Dachande, the brave one, opened his eyes at the sound of the Yacha death cry, and growled softly. Tichinde. And he pursued the creature, the Uman whose smell had become familiar. The desperate Uman ran to the table in front of Dachande's resting place and snatched at a burner clumsily. Tichinde towered over it, ready to deliver the death blow to the panicked Uman. The Uman, who had nurtured him through the dark, what could have been his final moments until Dikade. Death. The Chande lifted one of his arms, the strap holding it snapped. He thrust his talon forward and caught the staff right below the table. Tichinde's head jerked up in surprise. With a quick shove, Tichande rammed the staff upward and knocked Tichinde backward. Tichinde jumped up and popped his wrist forward, extended the double blade toward Tichande. The leader growled in fury. Tichinde would raise a weapon against him? Had he lost his memory? Tichande freed his other arm easily and struggled, tried to leap. His lower body was still bound. And then the world exploded into a million flying pieces. The sounds of battle were unmistakable. So was Miriam Revna's scream. Noguchi stamped the pedal and ducked. Miriam cried out and fell to the floor as the wall cracked open in a roar of thunder and shattered around her. A chunk of something sharp and heavy gouged her right calf. The pain was horrible. The terror was close. The thunder ceased. Miriam pulled herself around a table leg and turned to see what had happened. Noguchi had come through the wall. The bike was turned on its side and Machiko was propped on her elbows, pistol aimed behind Miriam. The doctor snapped her head around and saw that the attacking creature was sprawled on the floor. 
It didn't move, but she could hear its labored breathing. The patient was still on the exam table, pinned there by one remaining bond across its abdomen. He fumbled with the strap frantically. Noguchi had her gun pointed at the struggling patient, her finger tightened on the trigger. Then she heard a voice coming from the direction of the injured creature. She was surprised and confused to recognize the voice was her own. You only have six rounds. Don't waste any on warning shots. The doctor stood up right in the line of fire. Jesus, get down! Noguchi's heart pounded. Miriam didn't even look back at her. She held both of her hands up and walked slowly toward the tethered warrior. The Chande redoubled his futile attempts at freedom as the Uman came at him. The creature held its odd, clawless hands open and moved slowly. The other, dressed as a warrior, had a weapon on him, but the approaching Uman blocked the small warrior's efforts. It could be a trick, a ploy to calm him before the soft meat ripped him open. But the slow-moving creature was the one that had tended to him. If it had wanted him dead, wouldn't it have struck when he was injured and unaware? There was a thick bandage of some kind around his chest, not the work of a hunter. A healer, then. The Chande stopped his labors and held still, but kept his body tensed and ready. He hissed a warning to the Umin, and it leaned toward him, very slowly, and unlatched the restraint. Miriam unhooked the bond and stepped back, careful not to move suddenly. The creature had growled at her, a foreboding gurgling sound, but didn't attack when she was in reach. What are you doing? Miriam kept her eyes on the patient. I think it's okay, she said softly. The creature studied her for several long seconds. Miriam held still, not wanting to frighten it. Are you insane? Noguchi was furious. They killed Hiroki and six other men. She didn't move. They did. He didn't. Miriam was scared, in spite of her intuitive feeling that the creature wouldn't harm her. Intuition wasn't a lot in the face of death. The Chande inspected the Uman thoughtfully. This is what he had wanted to hunt all of his life? It was ugly, but certainly not dangerous looking. It was stupid, too. Approaching a warrior with no weapon didn't indicate a particularly high intelligence. Or it was incredibly brave and ready to do battle. Small as it was, if it wanted to fight, Perhaps it was also mad. The armed one babbled at the Uman next to him. Dachande got the impression that the defenseless creature had kept him from being killed. The Uman with the handheld burner lowered the weapon slowly. Dachande tilted his head at her. Fascinating. Then it was that Tachinde clattered his mandibles and slowly got to his feet. Dachande's anger flared. With his mask secure and the copier functioning, he spoke to his student, also in Michiko Noguchi's voice. What kind of mood do you think they're in right now? The Chande jumped past the Uman and whacked Tachinde's skull. The blow knocked the student to the ground. Tachinde said nothing, but scrabbled at the pouch of his belt. The Chande snatched the sack from the idiot Yaucha and held it up. Trophies. Uman trophies. His rage was blinding. Tachinde had hunted with no supervision, and had hunted Uman. The Chande lifted the Yaucha by his tresses, the fury boosting his strength. He could smell his own musk, hot and heavy with a desire to kill. He raised one fist and smashed Tachinde in the mouth. Tachinde tried to pull away, responded with a weak blow to Tachande's gut. Tachande howled in his face, a shriek of pure disgust and outrage. He struck again. Tachinde was his student, once. He had broken the rules of the hunt. There was only so much slack the Chande could give him, even as a leader. Now the rope must be pulled tout. Now the Chinde must be destroyed. It was the law. It was a matter of honor. Noguchi watched in amazement as the two huge warriors fought. The broken-tusked patient was the most skillful and was winning easily. Noguchi ran forward, pistol ready, and grabbed the doctor by the arm. Come on, Miriam. While these two decide who's the most macho, we've got work to do. She and Miriam ducked through the shattered wall and ran across the compound. Noguchi steered them toward the main garage, to the east. The med center was closer to the holding pens, but they would need a flyer for what she had in mind, and the hover bike was totaled. There would be other hover bikes at the garage, except Miriam can't fly one, and they won't carry two people. Noguchi wanted to scream. Fuck, fuck, fuck. And on the heels of the panic, she remembered the copter. The copter. We'll have to take the copter. 
They reached the vehicle. She opened the door and hustled Miriam in, still talking. Don't worry, we're gonna get out of here, okay? I'll help you fly this thing. Just tell me what to do and we'll be fine. That seemed to cut through the doctor's hysteria. Revna raised her tear-streaked face to Noguchi, eyes wide. Kesar always flew. I don't know how. Yeah, me neither. This should be interesting. She searched the myriad of buttons and switches on the console and found one that said Eng. She flipped it. The copter's engine hummed to life. She tapped her comm set. This is Noguchi and Copter... She looked over the board quickly. Copter 1, do you read me, Tower? A hiss of static. And then Weaver's welcome voice. We read you, Copter 1. We're almost ready. But you should see what's happening in the Southwest Quadrant. It looks like an all-out war. Sounds even better than I'd hoped for, Weaver. Stand by for my signal. Noguchi took a deep breath and strapped herself into the chair. Hang on, Miriam. The copter rose in a series of sharp jerks before Noguchi turned it toward the south end of the complex. Miriam still wasn't sure what the plan was, but she was glad to get off the ground. Where are we going? The holding pens. Scott and Tom had stayed quiet for a long time. The sounds outside of weapons fire and death cries were incentive not to move around too much. The monsters were out there, and maybe if they stayed under their rock here long enough, they'd eat each other and go away. Scott figured out they were in the southwest quadrant of the compound, in one of the two empty holding pens. There were six others, full of bellowing rinth, their cries mingled with the alien screams. I'm starting to think we're better off in this ship, Tom whispered. Yeah, right. Stuck in the spider's web waiting around for dinner. Their dinner. Scott cracked the door slightly to see if anyone was coming to help. So far, they had seen nothing. Well, no people. Strange, humanoid creatures were at war with the bizarre animals that had taken over the ship. It was too dark to make anything out clearly, but the situation was obvious. Between the screams and the weapons, there was one fuck of a battle going on out there. They couldn't tell who was doing what to whom and for what reasons, but it was bad. Scott was exhausted and he felt like shit. They had been stuck here for what felt like days. He wanted a shower, a steak, a few beers, and a soft bed. No way he was going out there to get it, but it helped to take his mind off the situation at hand, which looked like Armageddon. It was all so... unreal. He was sick and had been coughing and having cramps for over an hour, but he was trying to keep it to himself. The look on his face expressed enough. Scott looked at his friend, worried, then back out at the bloody combat. Something screamed piercingly and then was silenced. Hang on, Tommy, Scott whispered. We're gonna be okay. Yeah, maybe we'll sprout wings and just fly back to Earth. The Chande didn't want to spend too much time on Tachinde, much as he felt the idiot deserved to die slowly. He had wanted to find the other Yaucha, if there were any. Find out what was going on, how he had come to this state. It did not feel good what had happened. The Chinde fell again. His tresses were matted with Thwei, two of his mandibles broken and crushed against his worthless dying skin. The Chande waited no longer. He snatched Tachinde's bladed staff from the floor and raised it over his head. Brought the sharp blade down. He jerked the blade from the body in a patter of blood. The leader donned the Quay's armor and took his weapons. He left the bandage on his chest. There was some pain there. Perhaps the dressing would help. After a second's hesitation, he pulled the recording loop from Tachinde's chest. There might be use for it later. Armed and ready, with a fire in his gut that screamed for justice, Tachinde stepped into the dark night to find his other students. Perhaps Tachinde had been alone, but he doubted it. Hunting alone was not common behavior for the young. And if they were here, in the Uman camp, on a hunt, nothing would stop him from the lessons he would teach them. He ran through the oddly structured system of Uman buildings toward the sounds of battle. He ached all over, and at least two of his ribs were broken, but he put the pain aside, for now. Shattered buildings and other rubble littered the grounds. The Chande hopped over the torso of a fallen drone, its life fluid still hissed on the soil. He heard burners and screams in the distance, to the left. He cursed mentally and ran in that direction. They hunted Umans. Worse, they did so without proper surveillance. It was bad enough to have broken the law. To use poor strategy and tactics only compounded the error. The other two blooded must certainly be dead, 
they would not have allowed this. As sketchily trained as these Yaucha were, the bugs would be more than just a minor challenge. Armed Umans would be worse. One of the hard meat appeared suddenly, leapt from the dark shadows to scream at him. The Chande pulled his burner. He was in too much of a hurry for prowess feats. Suddenly, the drone screeched, turned, and ran. Unusual behavior, but they sometimes did that when there was a queen nearby. It was not fear, for they had none, but instinct to warn the nest. The threat was not the lone Yaucha, but the beginnings of Machiko Noguchi's plan in motion. I was right about the livestock. Being pent up all day under Beta Signi's glare had left the herd restless and irritable. Now, spurred on by the low-flying copter, they pursued a straight-line course for freedom. They saw everything in their path as an obstacle to be crushed underfoot. Everything. The Chande heard the rumble and immediately ran for the nearest structure he could climb. He spotted a ladder bolted to a tall structure and ran for it. He had not found the students yet, but before he could do so, he needed to avoid being crushed by the stampede. He hoped his students would understand what the sound meant and seek high ground for protection. He growled in irritation as he climbed the rungs of the ladder. If they paid attention to his lessons, maybe they wouldn't die. If they had not listened, then they deserved to die. That was the way of it. His hope was not all that good, considering how well they've learned so far. The Chande climbed as the rumble thickened into an all-encompassing roar. The searchlight on the copter illuminated the scene dimly. Noguchi only glanced at the panic herds. She had her hands full piloting. Miriam Revna cried out in delight. They just ran over about two dozen of the unclassifieds. It was hard to hear over the clatter of hooves and the bellows of the frightened Rinth. Noguchi smiled tightly and pulled up on the control stick. She wanted to check and see if the ranchers had gotten out. She veered east. All she needed to see were the lights of the AVs. Noguchi allowed herself a short rush of relief. The low red and white lights were visible. The ranchers and staff were headed away from town into open desert. It was working. Her plan was working. She circled the copter back toward the lector to make another run at the animals. The colonists were headed to relative safety, and the Rinth were stomping on everything in sight. Maybe she wouldn't have to sacrifice anything else. Of course, there were still the creatures on the ship to deal with, and it was probable that a few of the other kind had survived. As they neared the transmitting tower, Miriam sat up straighter and pointed. Noguchi shot a sideways glance at what the doctor motioned at. It was one of the warriors. It had climbed the ladder and was almost to the top, and there were three or four of the huge black bugs clambering up after him. Miriam saw the broken-tusked warrior nearing the top of the transmitter and pointed. Machiko, look! What? The stampede was deafening. Miriam shouted louder. It's my patient! We have to save him! Noguchi whipped her head around. Are you crazy, Miriam? Those things are the reason we're in this mess. She looked back at the controls. Miriam chewed her lip in frustration. How could she make Noguchi understand? It was important. The most important thing in the world right now. She could not have said why. But that one risked his life to save mine. Noguchi opened her mouth and then closed it. Look, I don't... Please. Machiko, he risked his life to save mine. The doctor looked at her patient, getting closer to the top now. The dark, segmented creatures were also getting closer. Please! Noguchi didn't say anything. She veered toward the tower. I must be out of my mind. That's it. I finally went insane. Noguchi steered the copter toward the tower in disbelief. The hell was she thinking? Dr. Revna was a nice lady. Ordinarily, she wouldn't mind doing her a favor. But this... She watched as Broken Tusk kicked at one of his pursuers and then stabbed the closest one. The bug screamed and fell. He refused to give up fighting. She'd credit him that much. But she could barely fly. Even a trained pilot would have doubts about trying to hover next to a tower. And to save an alien that they knew almost nothing about. Except that it had saved Miriam's life. Right. It would break every rule in her book to risk their lives on this and she had about a second to decide. Below them, the Rinth ran on. The Chande kicked at one of the drones and then used the spear to take out the gut of another. It fell, still kicking, but there were two others. 
He heard a ship over the sound of the running hosts, but he ignored it. He had enough to worry about. The metal he gripped let out a high groan. He could feel the structure shift under the combined weight of himself and the drones. Again, the weak substance creaked and started to separate from the building. If he didn't think of something, he would be on the ground in a few breaths, fighting the hard meat and in the path of the stampeding hosts. The Black Warrior must wish for Dechande's immediate company, and the Black Warrior eventually won all battles. Noguchi lowered the copter toward the tower, which had started to quake dangerously. It was collapsing under all the weight. Miriam fumbled around the console for a second and then hit a button. Her next words blared incredibly loud. Grab on. Grab the strut. We'll take you to safety. Noguchi winced. The doctor had found the PA. She lowered the ship a little more. It was hard, but not as hard as she had expected. On the other hand, a series of red lights had lit up on the control panel. She was too intent on the task at hand to figure out what they meant, but she also didn't want to find out the hard way. Grab on! Noguchi screamed to be heard. This is ridiculous, Miriam. I can't hold us here much longer. And he doesn't understand a word, you're... The copter dipped, and then pulled up again. He had grabbed onto the strut. Noguchi let out a cry of disbelief. It had worked. Broken Tusk had climbed to the copter. Now what the fuck were we going to do with him? And then everything happened at once. A dark shape lunged at them. Noguchi just had time to register that it was one of the bugs before it landed on top of one of the compressors, on the same side as Broken Tusk. It scrabbled to hold on, screamed. The copter tilted alarmingly and Noguchi jerked the controls instinctively upward. There was a rending screech of metal as the tower collapsed. And everything turned the wrong way as the copter went down. The pilots down below were witness to the crash. Tom shook his head and pointed. At first, Scott wasn't sure what he was looking for. Tom was motioning at a transmitting tower two structures away. Tom finally pointed straight up and then back at the tower. Scott looked up at the top and felt his heart jump. He looked back at the copter just in time to see it spin down toward the ground, toward them. Something had gone very wrong. One of the creatures had jumped on the roof of the copter and the pilot had panicked. They watched as the flyer spun out of control to crash a few dozen meters past them to the left. The explosion was loud enough to be audible above the stampede. It was getting quieter. The majority of the animals were already gone. By silent ascent, he and Tom opened the door and ran toward the crash, the stench of burning fuel and cooked dirt heavy in the air. The hot night had just gotten hotter. Noguchi opened her eyes as the thunder fell to the sound and heat of a bonfire. Above her, the Ryushi night sparkled with stars. She had a sunburn, and there was something wrong. She couldn't move. Miriam! Her voice was barely audible. A face appeared before hers, familiar, bearded. Conover! I should have guessed it'd be you. The pilot had the shout to be heard over the final remnants of the stampede. You're lucky to be alive, lady. Noguchi remembered all of it at once as Conover unbelted her and half-lifted her out of the wreckage. Jesus, who the hell taught you to fly? Behind Conover stood the other one, Strandberg. He looked sick. No one. Yet. Noguchi said. She sounded weak, hated that she did. All around them were bits of burning wreckage. The main part of the copter was behind them, still on fire. The flames crackled and danced. She leaned heavily on the pilot as they stumbled away from the smashed cockpit. Where's Miriam? She said. The doctor hadn't been next to her when she had come to. It was an effort to look around. Her neck didn't seem to want to hold her head up. Strandberg stepped forward and grabbed her other arm. Listen, we gotta get out of here. The bugs will be back soon. On closer inspection, she could see that Strandberg was sick. He looked like she felt. Shaky. Pale. Nauseous. The last of the rinth had gone. Besides a fading rumble, the only noise was the hiss of fire, and somewhere close by the piercing trill of a nightmare creature. Miriam, she said again. Broken tusk, Miriam had to save him. The pilots ignored her and started pulling her toward one of the holding pens. Noguchi pushed them away and turned back to the remains of the copter. Dr. Revna, the woman who was in the copter with me. I'm not leaving without her. 
Conover's voice was both apologetic and irritated at once. I didn't see anyone else, he began. And then he stopped. Oh, Jesus. Noguchi glanced at both of the pilots, who stood with looks of awe and terror on their faces. She spun back around and felt her heart sink. It was Broken Tusk, surrounded by flames. He carried Miriam Revna in his arms. He carried the Uman to the others. There were three. One he recognized as the armed Uman from before. The other two were bigger, but unarmed. They held very still as he approached. The small warrior held no weapon against him now. It ran toward him, the hold of its body frantic. The Jande could see that it was not an attack. The warrior reached him and then gently stroked the face of the dead one that he carried, its composure one of sorrow. It repeated something over and over as it touched the dead face. The Chande suddenly remembered the animal loop on his forearm and tapped it quickly. The Uman's language babbled back at it. The warrior looked up at him and then motioned for him to set the corpse down. The Chande did it gently. The Uman had shown him respect. He would do no less for it in its death. Noguchi stared in shock as she heard Miriam's voice spill out from behind the creature's mask. Grab the strut. We'll pull you to safety. Noguchi knelt over Miriam, could already see that it was too late. That's okay, Michiko. Someone else you cared about. Someone who depended on you. Dead. No big deal. Just because it's your fault. She allowed herself one second of pure grief. Her head dropped into her hands, and she let out a soft moan of despair and sorrow. The pain was sharp and cruel, the guilt tremendous and stabbing. And she didn't have time for it. Scott and Tom followed the Noguchi woman through a deserted alley in the dark town. Scott wasn't sure where they were headed, but Noguchi moved with certainty. He glanced over his shoulder from time to time, wary of the huge alien that brought up the rear. They had left the dead woman behind, soaked her corpse with fuel, and set it ablaze. Conover and Strandberg were the last two people in Prosperity Wells I'd have wished to be stranded with. But now that Miriam was dead, they were the last two people. Somehow, they'd missed the events of the past 28 hours. I brought them up to date. I told them what I knew of our companion and his kind, how they had arrived equipped for a safari. I explained my theory about the bugs, as they called them, and the warriors being somehow connected. Are you saying that they... He tilted his head back at the giants. Let those bugs loose on a populated planet so they could hunt them? He kept his voice low. Noguchi nodded. Just a theory, but it fits. Except I don't believe his kind knew there were humans on Ryushi. And from his actions, they weren't supposed to be shooting at us. We haven't been here long. I doubt we were here the last time they dropped in. Her voice was edged with dry sarcasm when she next spoke. I imagine we would have remembered if they visited recently. And I imagine our presence probably screwed up their plans. Scott raised his eyebrows. Screwed up their plans. Oh, that's great. I feel so much better knowing that this whole mess was an accident. Noguchi shrugged. Hey, at least he's on our side. Yeah, until he gets hungry, Scott mumbled under his breath. Noguchi stopped at the end of the alley and waited for the giant to catch up to them. She kept her revolver barrel pointed up. Okay, the stampede started just around the corner here. I'm going to walk through its path and see if there's anything left alive that shouldn't be. Swell. Scott looked around for some kind of weapon. Besides a few small rocks, they were out of luck. They'd have to stick close to the woman. The stretch of open ground was littered with dozens of bodies, rinth, bug, and giant alien. Large patches of soil were eaten away to reveal charred black splatter-like stains, as if the blood from the corpses was toxic. The rinth were cut or blown open. Chests shattered, throats slit. The black bugs were mostly crushed, so also the giants. The only light was from a sole street lamp that hadn't been broken or shot out. The resulting mix of dark and death and shadows was forbidding, ominous, ugly. When you kill something, you don't fool around, said Scott. Noguchi wasn't listening. Her gaze darted from side to side, her revolver still up. The giant's head was cocked to one side, his stance ready. The two of them moved forward slowly. The pilots stayed close. 
The four of them made their way cautiously down the ravaged street, stepped over torn bodies and corpses smashed down deep into the cracked earth. Apparently, this was where the fight had ended. After a moment of tense silence, Tom whispered loudly to Scott as they followed their armed escorts. Do you think this stampede got them all? Scott started to reply, but stopped short. He had heard something behind them. The cry of a bird, perhaps. A chittering sound behind one of the storage buildings. Sudden movement. Scott felt his mouth go dry. He had heard it before. Run, he said, hardly able to get the word out. Run! The Chande heard the hard meat and spun around. He sprinted past the two Uman strangers toward the threat, staff forward. He was dimly aware that the small warrior was right behind. It shouted something at the other two. They came in a single file stream, flowed from around a structure. Ten, maybe twelve. The Chande leapt to greet them. Two arrived first, angled in from the sides. The Chande spun, swung completely around cut them both through their midsections in one strike. He extended his spear and slashed through the throat of the next drone nearest, to his right. The drone's death cry was garbled through its own thway. A split second later, he jabbed the staff point through the jaws of another, twisted the sharp blade and dug a hole through the top of the skull. The weapon's metal was proof against the hard meat's thway, but there was no time to hesitate and enjoy the kill. When you fought the 10,000, you did so one at a time but you also had to do so quickly. The Chande jumped forward, stabbed the throat of yet another, and then spun to meet the next. Death fell all around his feet as he and the hard meat danced. Here was no inexperienced novice. Every step was measured, every strike timed and sure. Within the space of a few seconds, most of the bugs were down, dead, or dying. She had enough training to recognize a master when she saw one. This one's skill had been gained in battle, against deadly enemies. Broken Tusk whirled and jabbed, crouched and slashed with precision and confidence. Never a misstep, never a hesitation. He was no dojo tiger, covered in padding and fighting for points. Wherever he had come from, they had a martial arts more complex and dangerous than any she'd ever seen. It was like a choreographed dance. Except, we don't have all day. Noguchi aimed and fired several shots, then aimed and fired again. The last two shrieked and stumbled. Broken Tusk hesitated, confused perhaps, then finished them both with slashes to the gut. Sorry, Noguchi ejected the spent rounds and slapped in a loader, but we've gotta go. Broken Tusk stared at her for a second, then raised one claw in understanding or camaraderie she didn't know. She returned the move, then started back toward the east lock. The warrior caught up to her easily, then slowed and strode at her side as they rounded the front of the ops building toward the lock. He made thick growling noises, strange but somehow not threatening. Ahead, the lock was open. Conover stood by the control panel inside, face pale. Noguchi heard now familiar chirping noises behind them, not far. Noguchi and Broken Tusk ran through the entry together. The door slammed down. A second later, there were several thundering crashes. The metal door shook as the nightmare creatures threw themselves at it, but it wouldn't give. Noguchi closed her eyes. They were safe, at least for the moment. Safe and fucked. They hadn't gotten them all. Okay, we're in. So what's the plan? Well, the colonists made it out safely. That's the main thing. We've got power here, water, and food. I guess we'll just seal ourselves in and wait for the marines. Tom had scanned over the memorandum from Chigusa Corp, angrily passing it to Noguchi at the revelation of its contents. Wrong. The Marines aren't coming. Seems your boss wants the bugs alive. Noguchi read over the company response aloud. Most immediate. Request for Marine intervention denied. Take steps to preserve all specimens of species described in Revna's report. Proceed with measures to ensure safety of all personnel, but take no action against living XT specimens. It was looking hopeless. Noguchi had never felt so frustrated in her life, or so angry. There was nothing she could do. Well, screw that shit, Conover had started pacing. I say we scram out of here and join the colonists. She looked up at the red-faced pilot and shook her head. Yeah? And how long before the bugs run out of food and head into the desert looking for more? Conover dropped his gaze and said nothing. 
Look, I don't know about you two, but I'm tired of being pushed around. I want to start pushing back. I want to finish this, and I want to finish it now. She wasn't sure how, but there had to be a way. Conover snorted. Sure, great. What, are you going to burn down the whole complex? Strandberg coughed loudly. I don't think that'd work, Scott. Too many of them would get away. It's got to be... He coughed again. Something fast. Noguchi started running off possibilities in her head. Maybe they could formulate some kind of a bomb or gas. Conover jerked his gaze at Broken Tusk. Why don't we ask the Hulk over here? Maybe he's got a death ray or something. Strandberg shook his head. I'm serious. I think Miss Noguchi had the right idea with the stampede. Crushed them like bugs. He broke into a fit of coughing. Noguchi looked at Strandberg with sympathy. He really didn't look well. And he had at least tried to be helpful. The pilot regained his wind and raised one hand weakly. Something big enough to take out the complex and the ship at once. Conover interrupted angrily. You talking about what I think you are? Forget it. Noguchi stood and faced the asshole pilot. Don't hold out on me, Conover. If you know something that might stop those things, you'd better tell me. Strandberg started coughing again. Conover glared at her and jabbed a finger in her general direction. Look, I have shares in this little investment along with everyone else. There is nothing we can do, okay? Strandberg tried to stand up and fell to the floor. His coughing suddenly turned into hoarse choking sounds, and he spasmed and convulsed, clutched at his chest. Conover rushed to his friend's side and stepped back at the sight of blood on Strandberg's abdomen. Tommy? Noguchi gasped. The convulsing pilot screamed again and again, and at the same time there was the sound of ripping, shredding, the sound of flesh parting. A creature the size of Noguchi's forearm burst through Strandberg's chest in a spray of blood. Dripping with blood and slime, the animal looked surreal, its head dominated by rows of teeth. It coiled its long, flesh-colored body in the frame of Strandberg's bloody ribcage and screeched at them, and jumped. The larger Uman stood in Dechande's way. He pushed it aside and reached the Uman host just as the Kande Admita lunged forth. The Chande lifted his spear and brought it down, hard. He could feel the young drone's back snap beneath the weapon. Hot intestines squirted, blood hissed. The Chande stepped away and looked at the Umans. He waited. Scott couldn't seem to catch his breath. Oh God. Tom. Jesus. Tom still quivered all over, his fingers clenched and unclenched. And then nothing. The giant had squashed the alien parasite quickly and neatly. It was over that fast. And Tommy lay next to him, the slick innards of his body exposed, his eyes open. Scott turned away and dry heaved a few times, the retching bringing only a sour spit. And then he understood. He sat up stiffly and put a hand on his stomach, and coughed, and started to cry. Noguchi looked up at Broken Tusk, who watched mutely, and then back at Conover. She crouched down next to the crying pilot and put a hand across his back. She kept her voice low, but didn't hesitate. Look, I know Strandberg was your friend, but you can't go to pieces yet. I need you functioning. Before Strandberg... He was about to tell me something. Something that could wipe out the bugs. Conover turned his tear-streaked face up to look at her. You don't get it, do you? What happened to Tom? That thing was inside of him. We were together on the Lecter. That means I've got one of those things inside me, too. My life's over. Leave me alone. The pilot's face crumpled in despair. He buried his face in his hands and started to sob loudly. Noguchi let him cry for a moment, then patted him gently on the back. She felt like a real bitch for what she was about to say, but there was no way around it. You're not dead yet, Conover, and we still need your help. We're all in this together. He continued to rock back and forth. And if I don't help you? Think you can threaten me now? Noguchi stood up. No, but maybe I can help you. Conover looked up at her and wiped his eyes with the back of one hand. Help me? How? Are you a doctor? 
You gonna perform surgery and make me all better? Noguchi shook her head. No, I can't do that. But you can have a shot at revenge. She took a deep breath. And I can make it quicker. Easier for you. The mixed look of pain and self-pity and gratitude on the pilot's face made her stomach clench. Conover was an asshole, but he didn't deserve to die for it. Okay, he said quietly. Fuck it. Yeah, okay. Scott sat at the terminal, his eyes gritty and his hands trembling. He was going to die. He was going to die. The thought was a repeating loop in his mind, a horrible and constant statement of looming black truth. He was pregnant with a monster. He was going to die. Scott shook his head and finished the sentence he had typed onto the screen, almost done. His stomach hurt, and with each second it got worse. He coughed into his hand and tapped a few more keys. Everything you need is on the disc, he said. His voice sounded dead too. Noguchi nodded. She sat next to him and watched carefully as he worked. Thanks, Conover. Scott, he said softly. It suddenly seemed very important that she knew his name. Because he was going to die. Thanks, Scott. He felt a few more tears trickle down his face and onto his beard. It had been like that for the last twenty minutes. Knowing you were about to die was bad. Very bad. It's gonna be tough getting in, he said. Don't worry. We'll find a way. I don't doubt it, he said. He coughed, the painful spasm filling him with dread. He took another deep breath and coughed again. It was getting worse. He smiled weakly at Noguchi. You know, if this works, the company's gonna be really pissed. She straightened slightly and then laughed. She seemed surprised by the sound. So was Scott. Fuck the company, she said. Yeah, I was hoping you'd say that. On a sudden impulse, Scott grabbed at a piece of paper on the console and a pen. He made a quick sketch, studied the drawing for a moment, and then added a few more details. He folded the paper in half and handed it to Noguchi. Here's a going away present, he said. He coughed and pressed one hand to his stomach. He tried not to think about it. You're going to die. It's a map of the Lector, he continued. I should have thought of it before. She slipped the paper into a chest pocket and nodded. Behind them, at the door, the shrieks of the alien bugs had gotten louder. Sounds like every bug in the place is trying to get in, he said. Well, all but one of them. It's already in. It's alright. We're ready to go. She stood. Scott nodded and coughed again. A kind of calm slipped over him, a sense of unreality that made him feel far away from all of this. It didn't matter, not really. He should be scared, he had been scared, but now, in this moment, he was somehow floating above it, watching himself, as if he were someone else. It was a done deal, end of the line, and while he had never dreamed it would happen this way, here it was, and what choice did he have? At least he had helped. It would even make some kind of difference. He wouldn't be around to see, but at least he wouldn't be in pain. The damn repeating line would end. The giant alien walked over to meet them when Noguchi stood. Noguchi's voice came from the creature. I can make it quicker. Easier for you. Noguchi held up one hand. No. I made the promise. I'll do it. The giant seemed to understand. It stepped back. Weird, said Scott. He coughed, and with it came an odd, nauseous feeling, like he had swallowed something alive. Just do it, okay? Close your eyes, Scott. Count to three. Scott closed his eyes. He sensed the barrel of the weapon behind his skull, and he clenched his eyes tighter. He was afraid, but he was ready. I'll remember you said Noguchi gently. One. Two. Three. You're being awfully quiet, Tom. What's the matter? You mad at me? Huh? No, I was just thinking. 
Look, I know you said it as a joke, but maybe I should go on one of those safaris, or sign on as a ranch hand. Maybe it'll turn out you're right, and I wouldn't like it, but I should at least give it a try. A change of scenery might be just what I need. Get back to the land and living things, get some adventure and uncertainty back into my life. Did I ever tell you that I went hunting once? I had an uncle who was wealthy. He took me quail hunting when I turned 15. Said it would make a man out of me. But all I could think about was how big my shotgun was and how small the birds were. I guess I could understand the potential for excitement in the hunt, but for me, the thrill went missing. The contest seemed so lopsided. I wondered what it would be like to hunt something that was capable of hunting me. The challenge. The danger. To put yourself on equal footing with nature. To risk everything on your own skill and strength. That's got to be the ultimate thrill. I mean, look at what we do for a living. Access the computer, punch in a few buttons. All the work is done for us. Anybody could do this job with the right training. I want to do something that'll get my heart pounding. I guess that's what I meant by my anti-technology tirade. It's not that technology is evil in and of itself, but once in a while we have to put it aside and do something to remind ourselves that we're alive. Prove that we can accomplish something relying solely on ourselves. I can't help but think an experience like that would change a person. Maybe not in a way that other people would notice, but it would be something that you'd carry with you for the rest of your life. Geosynchronous orbit in five hours. Check on CHX. There's some flutter, but we're compensating. We can decouple any time after orbit is achieved. Then it's Hello Ryushi. Jesus. What a dust ball. Shit, Tom. What kind of mouth breather would want to move all the way out to this hellhole? Especially when there's land available on Nova Terra. I don't know, Scott, but I'll just bet you... Ryushi is somebody's idea of paradise. In this series, I'm recounting the trials of Michiko Noguchi and her experiences with the Yaucha species. For more on this character, please see the playlist on the end screen and in the description below. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like. And you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from Alien Theory. A very, very special thanks goes out to Whaling Utani Executives, Emurik, Mark Fox, and Lady Anne, part of the Patreon Hive. I'd also like to thank a new Queen level patron, Albert Newell. Welcome to the Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.